Okay, we're going to get started. And I will read the script that you will hear at every session. Uh, this morning's plenary is being live streamed on Zoom and recorded. An edited version of the recording will be posted publicly following Ari, likely in a month, because I need to recover. If you have questions during the Q&A session and would prefer your voice not be heard on the public recording, please either ask somebody, someone else to ask the question for you, or let me know after the session and I will edit you out of the final video. I will also just note the regular sessions are not being recorded, only the plans. Well, thank you again. It's always weird to introduce myself. So we have a special guest to do our introductions this morning. It is uh, Catherine Newsom, who is the Louisiana State Archivist. Good morning, everyone. I'm so, so happy to welcome you not only to LSU, which is my alma mater, but Baton Rouge, which is my hometown, and Louisiana, which is the state that I was born and raised in. So, so glad that you are all here. And again, I'm Catherine Newsom. I'm the director of the State Archivist and the State Archivist for the state of Louisiana. If you have not already done so, I'll do a plug for our field trip on Wednesday. We are doing a tour. So if you'd like to come and see the State Archives, we would love to have you. So I have the distinct honor and privilege to announce our two speakers for this plenary session. Um, they don't really need introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway because that's what I was asked to do. So uh, first, Dr. Edward Benoit III is the Associate Director and Associate Professor in the School of Information Studies at LSU. He's the coordinator for the Archival Studies and Cultural Heritage Resource Management Programs. He received his MA in History, his MILS, and his PhD in Information Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. His research focuses on participatory and community archives, non-traditional archival materials, climate change, and archival education. He is the founder and director of the Virtual Locker Project, which if you don't know about, please go online. It's a very awesome project, which examines the personal archiving habits of the 21st century soldier in an effort to develop new digital capture and preservation technologies to support their needs. Also, we have Ms. Um, Jill, Trippinier. Uh, she earned her BA in Geography in the University of uh, Wisconsin Oshkosh, which I would not know how to spell except for the child brand. Oshkosh, gosh, yes. Um, and her MS in Geography from Florida State University and a PhD in Geography from Florida State University. She is currently the Associate Professor in Geography and Anthropology Departments here at LSU and also serves as the Director of Graduate Studies. Research interests include understanding extreme weather events, which happen a lot around here. It hailed a golf ball size at my house on Saturday night. That was awesome. With a focus on tropical cyclones in North American Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, tra uh, tropical climatology, climate change, geographic information systems, risk assessment, and statistical methods. Ongoing research investigates climate change influences in galleries, libraries, archives, and museums climate change impact to local farm stakeholders, climate change impact to Native American cultural resources in the Gulf of Mexico, and K through 12 educational climate science and extreme weather through growing weather uh, station network. So this is our, I believe, first full on session, plenary session of the conference. And so I will hand it over to Dr. Benoit, who will tell y'all about what they're gonna talk about. Thank you very much. Um, seriously, if you haven't made up your mind yet, all of our field trips are equally worthy. If you want air conditioning, the State Archives is a great place to go. Um, also, if you're interested in people like Bonnie and Claude, because there's a death certificate. Um, also, oh, I'm going to screw this up. Who, who is the uh, Madam? Um, oh, Marie Lowe. Marie Lowe's. Not confirmed birth, but definitely her confirmed death, um, because she was supposedly over 150 years old. So, anyway, I do want to start off by thanking you all for attending, both virtually online 
uh, but also here in person, and start off with a little story before we get into why we are actually here. Um, and this just has to do with collaboration. So don't just stick in your, your little silos looking for research collaborators. It turns out that Jill and I actually grew up very close to each other in a suburb of Milwaukee, had never met until we both were working here. And it was a former student of mine and a former classmate of hers that put us together. We had coffee one day and we just built a research project. So it, it's just great to reach out to other units, um, even within your own university, because you never know who might be able to help you out with some things. It would also be nice if other units reached out to archivists, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> so we are going to talk about Protect the Lamb. Uh, again, I have to give Jill credit. She came up with the acronym while waiting in line to pick up her, her son, right? Yeah. Uh, it is two C's in there, but if you go to the website, we have set it up where if you spell it normal protect, it will show up. Um, but it stands for providing risk of the environment's changing climate threats for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Come on. There we go. Uh, I always like to follow the adage of tell people what they're about to hear and then, you know, tell them. Uh, the outline for today, we're going to talk first about some origin, origins and background, the creation of a GLAM data set, and then I will kick it over to Jill to actually talk about the weather and climate and why they're not the same. Um, and we'll take a sneak peek into some of our early data that we have found and then wind up with next steps, future timeline, and end with questions. Okay, so the origins of this project, uh, some of the people associated with the inspiration are actually in this room. Uh, some are actually also online right now. And my first real connection with archives and climate change was through a group I was going to say organization, but it was a loose connected group called Project ARC, um, which stands for Arch Archivists Responding to Climate Change. You might have seen their website and their social media presence. It had, you know, an art on it, and it was great. Uh, this was back in 2015, back when there was a certain presidential election, and there were marches on science to make sure that science stayed funded. And there were a lot of really interesting things coming out of this group, including we had a, uh, a teacher um, all about climate change, along with some other things. Then there's the work uh, primarily of it, uh, Ira Tanzi and, and Ben Golden, um, who did some amazing early work with climate science and archives. They created the first repository of all archives, um, where they're all located, and they did an initial map, which is what's here. Then they started overlaying sea level rise information. And this really got me thinking, wow, this could really be something. Uh, Baton Rouge. I was living here in 2016, and we had a flood. It rained nonstop for four days, three, five days. And I do remember on the first day going, okay, it's raining a lot. By day three, okay, I'm starting to see people in canoes <laughs> and, and, and key robes, uh, which is a Cajun canoe. Uh, okay, people are going to look at me when I say that, but it, it's, um, it was a significant event here, and places that had never flooded before, flooded. Um, soon after that was the first time I was called by LSU to make the media rounds to tell people how to recover their flood damaged photographs. Uh, the video that you can find on my website, it actually got a million views uh, because it's been shared every time there's a disaster now. And then Hurricane Ida in 2021, was 
my first major hurricane. Uh, we kind of lucked out on a few before that, but Ida, it really slammed the Gulf Coast, um, knocked out power lines along, um, well, the Homa area, um, Thibodeau, a lot of fun other names that I'm not going to pronounce, um, but as well as New Orleans, and even Baton Rouge. I was without power for about a week. No, I lied. Four days. I was out for seven days, almost a minute. Yeah. Um, my power came back on the second I had cooked everything in my freezer. <laughs> and had a big party for our neighborhood. Because that's the way energy works. So I've really always been interested in this topic and trying to figure out how can we better prepare archives and museums and libraries for oncoming um, issues related to climate change. When we set up this research project, um, I went to IMLS, you know, our, our bread and butter uh, granting agency. IMLS is wonderful because you write a two-page grant application first. You don't start with a 40-pager, uh, and, and that's wonderful. But we set forth these research questions. What are the climate change-related risks most likely to provide threats to glands, uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums? How can climate change risk for glands be understood as a categorical scale when combining those threats most likely to need significant consideration? So this is the idea of could we provide a scale that everybody could use? to say, I'm a level five risk, I'm a level two risk, and we can know what that means. Uh, not only to help people plan, but also because if you can go to your funding agencies with documented proof of what your risks are, and that you're a certain category, it's a lot easier to beg for money. Um, that's a whole different topic that we won't get into today. Uh, what are the GLAM-specific climate change challenges, which is very alliterative? And how can collaborative research, a collaborative research agenda, best address these challenges with input from practitioners and academics? As I'll talk at the end, the very last year of this grant, we are hosting an ARI. But it's not ARI. It's a climate change version. We're basing it on how ARI operates to start a new initiative to bring climate change researchers together uh, to really tackle big challenges, brand challenges, and prioritize our research. With all that in mind, what have we accomplished this year? The first thing we needed to do is find out where all the libraries, archives, and museums are, um, and compile this massive data set, which I'll talk about in a second. We also then reviewed, did a comprehensive review of, with the help of two GAs of all of the LIS and a lot of non-LIS related current climate research um, to see what has been done, what has not been done, and where are the gaps. We then, I'm using we here very generously, uh, Jill and my other Kofi I then um, identified the major threats to GLAMS and gathered data associated with them from the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, ha, got it, uh, NOAA, uh, the National Hurricane Center, LSU has a uh, Southern Climate Impact Planning Program, which has an acronym, CLAP. No. Skip. Skip. Oh, I see it. Okay. <laughs> surge date data, which is about hurricane water surges. Uh, the NOAA Physical Science Laboratory and the National Center for Environmental Information. Okay. On to how did we build this data set? So I was not about to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we took existing data. And it took a while to find where some of this was hidden. Um, IMLS, great. They have museum data files up that have a ton of information in them. 
but the most recent one is 2018, before the pandemic. The public library survey, IMLS again, 2020, great data source. Repo data is that collection of archives, and that was last updated in 2019. To find academic libraries, um, if you didn't know, there's a National Center for Educational Statistics that tracks all academic libraries in the US. But that was last updated in 2012. Uh, does anybody know what an NWR is? Ah, one, oh, okay, yes. Uh, so an NWR, this is military. It stands for Morale, Welfare, and Recreation. Uh, because the military likes to name libraries that. It's just, you know, we can, again, rent a canoe or borrow a book. Uh, but that one we had to do manually. There is no compiled list. So we put all this together, and then we looked at the data. And there were about 15,000 entries that were a P.O. box, which is not helpful when you need your physical location. They didn't have a street address, or they were supposedly located in Antarctica, um, or the Gulf of Mexico, as we found, <laughs> uh, because it had the wrong lat law, or it had one that just can't physically exist. So we needed to audit that and cull all this information, and we had funding. So we hired 35 students. Uh, undergrads and graduate students to go through line by line and correct this data. If you want to know more about that, I'm just going to be plugging the poster session all week. Do go see the poster session. Uh, it is the poster that in the schedule has about 45 authors. <laughs> because I put every single student on that poster. Once that was all done, that took almost all this year. Our final data set includes about 78,000 entries. All of, I'm not going to say all, the majority of libraries, archives, and museums in the United States. But there are limitations. We're missing many community archives, many community-based museums that just either were established after our data sets or they've never been captured before. So we are putting the final tweaks on making sure all the data is lining up before we post it publicly online for anybody to use uh, in the future. And we're going to include an online form for if you are not in this data, if you're missing, if your entry is not correct, let us know so we can update it. And then using our wonderful advisory board who has connections all over the place, we're going to distribute this and hope to try to fill in these gaps. And every time, we're just going to keep updating the data as we move forward so that anybody, again, who wants to use this data set for other purposes, uh, for example, if somebody would like to collaborate on a research project with me looking at population density and um, GLAM density in the United States to see if there's a correlation. That would be interesting. Anyway, so that is the data set. And now we're going to talk about what, no, I'm not going to talk about weather and climate. I'm going to hand it over to a climatologist to talk about why the weather is not necessarily the climate. Yeah, awesome. Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Hi, good morning. My name is Jill Trepanier, and I'm very excited to be in front of you all today and talk about this project. Um, Ed, you know, he gave a little bit of that background, but it's pretty exciting to know that a student had to move all the way to South Korea, where he lives now, to then put two people in connection with one another that grew up in the same place and then work in the same place. So I always think geography is pretty exciting, but I'm biased. I'm a geographer. So I'm here today because I want to talk to you a little bit about where this project kind of situates itself in the context of thinking about climate change or weather and how we might be considering it. So first, 
What you're looking at is a climate, uh, what's called a climograph. This top graphic here, it has temperature and precipitation, and it's for Baton Rouge, Louisiana, over the course of the year. And then this is a picture of my front yard outside of the picture in my dining uh, of a window in my dining room. And I have both of those up there because they kind of represent similar ideas, but we look at them differently. And so the climate, as you see, and I'm not going to read it to you, but the climate is this idea of a longer term average that leads to what we might expect on the day to day when you look outside the window. But the climate itself is a longer period of time. Now, me, myself, I, I like hurricanes. As weird as that might be, I think understanding extreme weather behavior is fascinating. So when I think about climate, it's not always just temperature or precipitation. It's also things like hurricane climatology or the expected seasonality of hurricanes in the North Atlantic. When we expect them to happen, how bad we expect them to be, and what that's based on. So the climate is a system. It is a system of a series of inputs, and then what comes out of it is the weather. What we get on a day-to-day -day basis is what comes out of a climate system after we have a variety of different variables kind of situate or orient themselves in a certain way. And so that's kind of what I'm here to talk to you a little bit about today, is trying to understand the distinction between these two. So I'm, as I said, I'm a hurricane climatologist. So when a hurricane happens, whether it's Ida here in Louisiana, Hurricane Ian in South Florida just this last year, what, when that happens, the first question that journalists ask me is, is this because of climate change? Almost every single time. And I cannot say yes. I don't want to say yes, not just because it makes it seem a little bit scarier, perhaps, but they're not, it's not as simple as that. It's not as simple as saying what I'm seeing outside the window is related to a changing climate system. Because it might have happened in the current state of affairs, just as it was, but it might also be happening more often or more frequently, or the season or average might be changing as a product of a changing system. So when I'm trying to think about the two of these things, they're complicated and they're very much related to each other. But in this project, I am not here to say why the climate is changing. That is not the purpose of this project at all. The purpose is instead to think about historical representation of the stuff that we know goes into a climate system or what comes out of it, like the expected temperature in a place or precipitation in a place and then how we might think about how it might shift into the future, regardless of the reason, but being able to then prepare places like GLAMS or those who have vested interest in that area to try to think about what could happen and how they might be able to protect themselves as a product of that. So I'm gonna give you a tiny crash course in climate change. I could teach you for a very long time and I won't do that, but at the end, we will have time for questions. So if something I say was too fast, it didn't make any sense, or you know, I glossed over it too quickly and you want more, please ask, because I can, I can talk about all these all day long. So the first thing I want to point out to you is this idea of that, that sort of transparent picture in the background. That's just to showcase to you the idea that climate changes. It's arguably always in a state of change. That black line in that very back represents the actual temperature recorded of tens of millions of years ago. And you see how it goes up and then down and then up and then down. We have glaciers that grow, we have glaciers that melt. It happens all the time as a product of all sorts of different stuff, like how close we are to the sun or how much actual energy the sun is producing. It might be related to a massive volcano. So when Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, that is one of those variables that goes into a climate system and then you feel the impact from it. So it blew so much into the upper atmosphere, it actually made it to the stratosphere, which is the second layer up. All of our weather predominantly happens down in the first layer. Once you're in that second layer though, if you put stuff up there, it's gonna stay there for a while. And so it stays and moves all around the planet because the wind blows. And so as the wind blows and things move around, it blocks out solar radiation, and then we get a little colder. And this was just in the early 90s. So this happens all the time. We get volcanoes that explode. We get a little bit closer to the sun, a little bit further away. These are large scale patterns that shift, or even an anomalous occurrence of a volcano erupting that then will lead to an impact in the climate system that we will feel the effect of, changing the everyday weather, okay? When we think about what's happening today, 
I am not here to tell you who and what and why and where, you know, all, maybe where, because that's sort of my jam. But the other stuff is not so much. The, the idea, though, is that there are two kind of main fundamental things that shift the planet's weather and climate, weather as a product of climate. One of them is really big anomalous occurrences like a volcanic eruption, the other the relationship with the sun. And the reason that that volcanic eruption plays a big role is not just because it blocks out solar radiation, but it also puts greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. You've heard this word before, or these, this phrase, I am confident of that, because if you turned on a television any time in the last 30 years, and you were on the news and somebody was talking about climate change, they were talking about how carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and it's terrible for the planet. Not really, right? Carbon dioxide is a great thing on the planet. We need it in various places, part of our carbon cycle. But when we think about Pinatubo erupting or a massive shift in Earth, think a landslide and it exposes a whole bunch of stuff, it puts gases into the atmosphere. Those gases are a good thing. It helps keep us warm enough, warm enough to live on planet Earth, but it does impact the climate system. And so right now, there are a lot of people driving around all the time. Massive industry has been for a long while now, good solid 140, 50, 60 years. And it's putting stuff into the atmosphere. That is without a doubt. And so when we as climate scientists are trying to think of what's the driving force, what's the mechanism that is shifting that we see today, is it more volcanoes? Not really. Is it that we're closer to the sun? Not so much. Is it because of these other reasons, like a shift in the El Nino Southern Oscillation? I'm not even going to say that again, unless you need me to. Okay? But is it shifts in these big fundamental planetary patterns? All signs point to no. There's something else driving it, but we're getting warmer. And so the question then becomes, well, what's the case? Why is the reason? That is not here. Well, not why I'm here. But I am here to then say, all right, if we as scientists agree that we play in some kind of role, the level of which we play the role we do disagree about, but I have not heard a scientist in a long while say that we play no impact. You can kind of look at Las Vegas, Nevada to see that we play a pretty solid impact in a place, it's a desert. It's not supposed to be what we have it, right? So there's lots of ways that we can see that an impact on a small scale exists. So we agree on that front. Then it comes into this idea of trying to add that to education. So in the, in the situation or the, the preamble that I got read prior to, to my coming up here, I'm a climatologist, but most of, if not all of the projects that I work on today is about taking what I understand about the climate system and then relating it to some other group of people that doesn't have that level of expertise in that field that also has a really awesome level of expertise in something else that I know nothing about. Archives, for example. I like to visit them. They're cool. I think I saw Bonnie and Clyde's death certificate and I was very nerdy for about a week about it. So I get it. I think it's fabulous, but I don't know how to protect them. But I can describe situations that they might be put at threat as a product of what I do know. So then pair that with actual policies. I'm not going to write policies, but I can provide information to help those that do so, and then actually lead to the mitigation or even ahead of time preparedness before an actual event occurs. Now, I'm a geographer, and I like using maps. So we are going to spend a little bit of time looking at maps together. But do you want to talk about this one? I will talk about how it's made quickly, and then you can jump in. So this is a, a map, <laughs> this is a map, and it is from, uh, this is the southern United States, the Gulf, of, the Gulf of Mexico coastal states, we might say. And in this particular software, this is called ArcGIS, or Geographic Information Systems, otherwise known as ArcMap or ArcPro. This is a geographer's bread and butter because it makes maps. And if I have spatial data, whatever that might look like, like uh, 70,000 entries with latitude and longitude for glands around the US, I can map it. And that's what I did here. And he's going to take over for a moment before I come back. Hold on. Oh. Yeah, wait for me. Yeah, we're too close. See, this is what happens. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for other people that are presenting in this room, if you need to adjust the light volume, it's the right thing. Um, also, I do just want to note, we will share this 
PowerPoint deck for anybody who wants it. Um, I'll just, well, we'll probably just post it on our website, which we'll show at the end. So this is preliminary based on, again, that data set that we had been working on cleaning up. Now you might notice that what appears red, I do not want to cross the threshold, so can you turn yes, the lights? That's the threshold. That's <laughs> Oh, well, I don't want people to go like that. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, too dark? Yeah, but there's a slider. Oh, I see it. It's fancy. Yeah, it's fancy. We have like. Oh, yeah. Is that good? Okay, so the reddish brown are archives, the green are libraries, and the orange is museums, and the white is an oops. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so there's not many. But you may notice that. Looking at this one, man, there's a lot of archives, uh, which we like. Well, what? No, that, there can't be more archives than libraries, can there? Um, well, with some of these big city centers, like, yeah, I didn't want to do this, but. OK. Well, now it's going to be difficult. I was say, my man bag has too many things in it. <laughs> No. For the record, he's looking for a laser pointer for those of you on pins and needles. Yeah, don't get too excited. Okay. And what did I do? I tripped over the gap. Right like I just warned everybody about. Ooh, okay. So like Montgomery, I think this is Montgomery, Alabama, or is that? No, this is Atlanta. But like Birmingham. Uh, it looks like that because, yes, there are a lot of archives there, but we would have to really zoom in because they're stacking on top of each other. The libraries, the archives, the museums. And not surprisingly, there's a lot of museums there, too. Also, a lot of these archives are clerks of court, um, where every county has one, every parish in Louisiana has one. So that's kind of why there are these things. But you can really see, you can guess, we can play the guessing game of what city is that, uh, just by looking at the various bullseyes. Um, I believe this is Houston, that's Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin, right? This is also me testing my geography. Um, here's New Orleans, here's Baton Rouge. I've been going for it. Uh, here's Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> and you notice, apparently nobody wants to live in the inside of Florida. No. Uh, except for, is this Tallahassee? No, that's, no, that's Orlando. That's Orlando. I, I've, I've only been to the Miami airport, and I'm proud of that. Uh, what's this? Anybody? That's Tampa. Okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and you can also see that it just kind of like stops because there are, you know, boundaries that we didn't put up all the states. Uh, so if we were to zoom in here, and we will, momentarily, you will actually see a lot more differentiation of where these locations are. Uh, it is really fascinating when you zoom out to the entire US, though, and just to see just how many glands there are throughout the country. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. awesome. Okay. okay. Cool. Okay, so as I said, so obviously they don't just stop, but here we have, I think it's about 12,000 entries in the Gulf Coastal States, um, and there's, while this itself is a stagnant picture, when I'm in the software, as he says, you can go into any individual place, I could color code these in all different ways to try to visualize more in a space, but this is, go ahead. This is just sort of our first pass at it. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this with the data set. We actually, in this data set, we have two levels uh, when we're coding what the institutions are. So the primary is, is it a gallery, library, archive, or museum? Everything then has a secondary level. What type of museum? What type of archive? So we could put a rainbow of colors here. So 
uh, state archives are color coded differently than clerks of court than uh, we could change. academic, uh, like libraries of archives of universities, things like that. We can change the symbology of my things, you know, I'm doing all the yelling and I'm doing it, does it? Okay. Um, we can change the symbology as well. So, for example, they might be color coded to their main type, but then I can change the symbol to be representative of their secondary type. So, there's a lot of ways that we might do it. Um, this one's going to make me smile when I see your faces. Hurricanes! <laughs> okay, so hurricane data are intense because they go back to 1851. They're not as good as the further back we go. We can have that conversation if you really want to. This is just in knots. All the pinks are really bad storms. That's why I gave them the obnoxious color. I love pink, don't get me wrong. But I, it's kind of bright. But I wanted them to be obvious to you. But this is hard to see anything else on the other side because there are so many of them. Now, I know you've heard the phrase spaghetti plots before if you live anywhere in a hurricane zone. If you haven't, awesome. Spaghetti plots are something your four-year-old makes on the ground on spaghetti night. Uh, but the, these are not actually a spaghetti plot. This is just the tracks of historical hurricanes. Spaghetti plots are the idea of a model and all the projected tracks that might come out of those different models that you might see. But if I'm going to try to take the glams, or we are going to try to understand the risk of these things to the glams, I have to take this and move one step further, or two or three steps. So the top graphic that's off over there to the left is those same tracks, but now they've been clipped to where they actually make impact or landfall along the, the, co the counties of the Gulf Coastal States. And then I can take that and I can turn it into a density map. Much easier for us to interpret. To go from this to this is a lot easier, but it's representing the same information. Now I want to say that this is just the occurrence of a tropical cyclone. And if a tropical cyclone hits 74 miles per hour sustained wind speed, she becomes a hurricane. Okay, but before that, it's all a tropical cyclone. Think of it as a really bad tropical thunderstorm. And if it gets bad enough, we give it a name. But this is just the occurrence of that, not a cat five or a cat one or any of that. But I can do the same thing for varying categories. And then if I pair this with all of those locations that we are trying to protect, it provides us with some context for one threat that exists from a tropical cycle, just having one, and then where a place or a group of places might be situated in relation to that threat. And you can see that in some places, like all of Florida, <laughs> all right, I, I've done a lot of research in Florida for a variety of reasons, but Florida's got a really bad gig when it comes to tropical cyclones. They're coming out of all angles, generally speaking, and so that's represented pretty well here. Here you can see New Orleans relatively well. I'll try to give me a thingy so that I don't wander too far. Okay. You can see the New Orleans kind of into the Bay St. Louis um, location in the Gulf, Central Gulf Coast. And even Houston, we know that Houston, if you're from the area or you're familiar with it, back in 2017, Hurricane Harvey came through. And it wasn't even a hurricane when it actually sat over Houston. People don't often realize that. It had been. It was a rapidly intensifying Cat 4 and then weakened as it got close to the coast and stalled and dumped tons of rain. So that's not represented here. Just the occurrence of them is, right? But give me a little more time. And that will be represented. We'll be able to look at precipitation patterns and temperature patterns in a very similar way as to what you see here. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. So we have an additional um, co-PI on this project. Her name is Dr. Jennifer Benoss. She is at Arizona State University, and she is my heat person. As much as I am the one that deals with rainfall and tropical cyclones and sort of these very extreme events that might happen in a weather system, uh, extreme weather events that happen in the climate system, she is the one that's very interested in heat, which is a bit more of a subtle risk, but very much a risk all by itself. So she is going to be the person that represents things like temperature or prolonged periods of high uh, temperature levels or maximum temperature. Even we're going to try to consider things like 
um, power outages and what that might mean in places who have those very high temperatures, we're familiar with them here, or issues with humidity control and so forth. So we're going to try to find ways to represent that. And, so, and the opposite, cold snaps. Yes, right. Well, because anybody who lived in Texas a few years ago, yeah. <laughs> the power went out. Ice storms are not necessarily something that are super equipped to deal with. Oh, uh, okay. And then, so don't click this, it's not going to Okay, so this one is a little wilder because the, the risk of a tropical cyclone is something that is um, easier to try to explain to somebody because they've seen them on the news, they know that they're really bad when you're thinking about a really bad weather event coming into a place. Sea level rise is a bit sneakier. So when we think about a changing climate, regardless of the reason it's changing, sea levels are one of the first things to start to change as a product of glowing, glowing, growing or shrinking ice sheets. Glowing ice sheets are cool too. When they grow and ice sheets and glaciers grow on planet Earth, sea levels drop because it's using some of that water and then the reverse is true. When they melt, sea levels go up. And the, melt, the glaciers have been melting for 20,000 years and it's got nothing to do with people driving Hummers and everything to do with the fact that we have been shifting out of a cold period for a long period of time. We've just sort of hit the fast forward button a little bit. Okay, so we've been melting for a long time. We, ice on planet Earth has been melting for a long time. By 2100, so to give you a context, I'm a six year old. This is when my six-year-old will be a grandma, or I don't know if that's her choice, but when my six-year-old is old enough to be a grandmother in her home, this is the time period that I'm talking about. So not so far. When people say 2100 seems like a million years from now, I can tell you right now that 2023, 20 years ago, seemed like a lifetime away. And suddenly, here I am. And that seems like it was not that much time at all. So the 2100 idea is not that far from now. And NOAA has projected that we will have three feet of sea level rise in a variety of different places across the coast. Now here in Louisiana, because we, this is zoomed in to just Louisiana, you get a little bit of Mississippi in there, but where you see it further, but you see that, <laughs> sorry zoomers. <laughs> You see this, um, this edge of where that outline is? And this is just a study for Louisiana, this particular one. So what this is suggesting, here in Louisiana, we are often not slow paced when it comes to climate change. We're the opposite. Often here, we say there's a fast forward button on climate change because we have active systems working against one another. So because we've levied up the Mississippi, we have a lot of subsidence that happens near the mouth of the Mississippi as opposed to land building. So we're sinking at the same time that the oceans are rising. So it's both are coming at us. So if anywhere is going to be closer to this three feet projected sea level rise, it's here in Louisiana than anywhere else. There are other places that are also at risk. But that's why I chose three feet. They projected out to nine feet. And nine feet Baton Rouge is full front coastal property. Um, okay. So here is New Orleans, Louisiana, and you will note that it still exists. Everywhere that you see this gray, this darker gray, is our actual land cover. And then this is the sea level rise, that, or the projected sea level rise, excuse me, to cover the land that was once there. So these places, for example, that presently have actual land property will be underwater. <coughs> And I realize this is so dramatic, and I am not up here to be like, everything is going terribly and everyone will be underwater by 2100. That is not why I'm here. But I am here to suggest that the idea, what we projected forward, does suggest that those places are at the higher level of risk when it comes to that, that need to try to preserve those resources quicker than maybe other locations, okay? This, the reason New Orleans is still there is because these models have existing levee structures built into them. So what I mean by that is there is a multi-billion dollar seawall that exists outside of New Orleans, Louisiana, and it is the only reason that Hurricane Ida did not flood the city of New Orleans last summer, or two summers ago. It went out of power, but the wall worked. That is a win, because it got flooded in Katrina, and Rita, and Wilma, and then not in Ida, and all accounts should suggest that it should have been. 
And so it's fantastic that the wall works, but the wall is built into this process. So if you see that, you're like, well, that's weird, because New Orleans has so much water coming, it's because we have levee structure. It does not mean they will sustain and last. It's just right now they're built and they should be good. What actually happens when 2100 happens, it might look a bit different, right? Well, maybe not, yeah. yeah. Okay, so moving onward. This is all of them together. And it's hard for me to make sure that you can see all the things, so I'm working on it. It might not be the best. You can tell me what I need to improve. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. This outline are the same county outlines that you saw on the earlier map. So it's the same uh, breakup of space. The bluish that you see, okay, that covers that area up to about here is where that sea level will rise. Pair it with the places that still exist, and then they've got the massive hurricane risk. So the idea now, and this is not the final piece, but when we're thinking about this categorical risk scale, if I'm a location over here, and my, my actual threat of hurricanes is low, comparatively speaking, and my actual threat of sea level rise is low, their category for risk is maybe a zero in this state, maybe a one because they still do get some hurricanes, right? And then the other place where I'm looking at New Orleans might be at, a, at, I'm only looking at two here, right? So two actual threats. We might think about it as a higher category, as a product of that. Now, how we actually quantify this, actually quantify it when it comes down to it, I don't know exactly yet. We're just kind of starting to learn it ourselves. But we see here how they might be mapped in the same space and allow us to try to contextualize what those threats then look like I did again. So some of the last things that we'll talk about, we're nowhere near done, we're just starting this process. But I said a lot of this already. One of the things that when getting the tour of the state archives, it was very apparent to me, also important to collaborate, because I wouldn't have thought of this, though I probably should have, is the concerns over humidity control. And certainly, I know that if you've got a working air conditioning system, humidity control is good. But what happens when that power goes out and you don't have backup generators to try to, to maintain that process, right? So that's one of the things that's probably the hardest for me to conceptualize mapping. But I will figure it out. I just don't exactly know how it works. So I'm working on it. But we call that science. <laughs> OK. Now, I'm going to I did not log in. So let's get to the end of the presentation, and then I'll click on this. So that way I, mean, I can kind of clear it up while we're answering some questions when we talk about it. Yeah, you never know when your uh, generator might break up. Uh, yeah. uh, also, why you shouldn't put your generator on the ground floor? Yeah. The State Archives, it's on the fourth floor, isn't it? Yeah. Right where it should be, up on top, not where it floats. Okay, so what are our next steps? Well, we're going to keep doing what, we're, what we've been doing um, and doing this analysis and, and putting these various uh, <coughs> stages over. Year two is all about developing this risk assessment scale um, and, and just studying the data and getting it working. We have, uh, this upcoming year, we have another GA who is a master's student yeah. in GIS well, in geography and well, anthropology, focused on GIS, who apparently their application just said, I would really like to work with climate change and libraries. And libraries. It was weird. It wow. was wow. You know how you're looking for somebody and then they just fall right into you? It was weird, but great. So, yep. Good weird. And then year three, as I mentioned before, we're going to bring this all together and we are going to host, probably in this room, <laughs> Two years from now, maybe not in June. Uh, uh, an institute for art to bring archivists, librarians, museum curators, uh, professors, doctoral students, and climatology people all together to really focus our efforts of here's what we're all doing. Let's try and see if we can coordinate and prioritize so that we're not all trying to do the same thing independently when there's a lot, uh, limited resources and can we collaborate, 
collaborate to go after much larger grants? Could we develop a better relationship with, let's say, um, oh God, what's the foundation? The Mellon Foundation, who has an interest in climate uh, change and climate right now. And how do we move forward with that? Now, if you happen to be somebody who's interested in this area, do let me know because I'll make sure you're on the invite list. Um, because this is ILS funded and we will be, it's going to be very early area like where it covers flights and logic and not food. Um, but yes. Okay. If you want to look at our website, somebody please test this. Because <laughs> I want to make sure it works. Real. That's always scary when you put a QR code into something. Um, oh, I forgot to change my picture. It doesn't matter. I'm just a point on a map. Yeah, it works. Yes, it works. Um, it does work. Okay, excellent. So, bookmark that space. Uh, clearly, there's not much there right now, but probably in a month, the data set will be there. And you can start looking at that. And then we're just going to keep rolling out more and more stuff. Um, and Jill's going to turn the lights back on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can actually see each other. Oh, oh, God, turn that one back off. Sorry! <laughs> <laughs> ah. uh, and leave it to faculty members to uh, end almost exactly on time. Okay, well, here, I want to bring up the story map. But, yeah. yeah. So oh, we, we are going to have, oh, and it works up from online as well. Cool, Excellent. thank you. Um, so this is something that we will have on our website eventually, but it does currently, because it's not published, require Jill to uh, log in. Um, but we, we'll, we've got plenty of time for questions and perhaps answers. Yeah, I just saw the news that most of our LSU logins are going to switch to the uh, Microsoft 365 login with the double authentication where if you don't have your phone, you can't... Yeah, anyway. uh, sorry, that's, that's me ranting or vamping, if you will. Okay. So one of the things, first, I want to preface this. I hate to do that disclaimer. Um, I made this in about 45 minutes the other day. <laughs> that is not to be like, oh, I made it in 45 minutes. I made it in 45 minutes. So please don't judge if there's a typo or something like that. But the idea was, at the end of all of this, what we will have available to the public is not just the data set itself, but there will be a place where the public can go, if, whether that's somebody who is a patron for a library that goes all the time, or it's the director of the library, to actually see what we call story maps that describe the threats in a place. And so there might be one for Galveston, Texas, and it talks about different places. There might be one for, I don't know, I'm just going to, a community center that somebody asked us about, right? There might be one for a variety of different purposes. This particular one is just taking the maps that I showed you earlier and showing you what it might look like in the space um, that we have. So I simply have here, you know, there's a little you know, description about how we build the data. And if you go down, you see the maps. We can describe what we see within that space. And it's a publicly available interface that then people have access to everything that we're doing. It's not something that's only going to show up in an academic article that only five people are going to read in the next five years. That's not the idea. The idea is to make it as accessible to the outside world as quickly as possible so that people can utilize the information, maybe in their own you know, grant building ideas for trying to protect their space or just trying to build a hazard mitigation plan for their facility because they have to have one for it. Okay, and then at the very end, we've got the giant. Just giant. to say the biggest it's QR code. giant. <laughs> and I can adjust like all of these things, right? That's what's kind of neat about, about these storyboards made within ArcGIS. And I know you saw that I had to log in, and because I have not made it publicly available to the world yet because of the thing I said earlier in the 45 minutes. There's definitely cycles in there. And, and, but, and it turns out that 
you got to watch out for that. Uh, once you turn it on, you can't turn it off. So yeah, you really got to be, <laughs> really be confident. I mean, you can edit it still, obviously, but yeah. okay. Yeah. So no. questions that okay. may lead to answers yes. or discussion. I think that's Thank you. It is going to happen sometime this week. Just think of it as Indiana Jones, Last Crusade, don't cross the seal. <laughs> um, so my, hi everyone, I'm Itza. Um, so not representing Project ARC, but definitely in the interest of Project ARC. Um, who are the community institutional partners that y'all have already like established a more working relationship with or are interested and can we help connect you to any of them? Yes, yeah, so um, we've been working with, we, we have two, I'm gonna back up here. Our advisory board, um, we have representatives from, well, all three areas, museums, archives, and um, libraries. And this is actually one of the areas that we're actively trying to get better with by reaching out to, for example, in Louisiana, um, the regional, so the Louisiana Archives and Manuscript Association, where entry level is a lot lower for organizations to be involved. And we're really hoping that when we put out the call for updates, that people who know other institutions will be able to forward it on. And it's something that we will actively ask for. But yes, if you know anybody, we're really happy to collect it so we can make sure um, to make them included. The other nice thing with the story maps and the way this will all work, even if you're not in the database right now, but you, you personally know where you're located, you can still zoom into that spot and see what is the issue. Um, but we would much rather have you in the, the data set. Um, did, did that answer your question? Yeah, it, it's a problem it is really the, the answer because, well, Anna and I wrote the whole book check. Where is Anna? Oh, okay, well then she won't hear me talk. We wrote a whole book chapter about uh, mediated spaces and how a lot of community-driven things have no association whatsoever with an institution, and they want it that way. Yeah. Uh, but how to make sure that we also include them. Yeah, it's, it's an issue. Ricky. So we need to make sure that. Are you gonna be the mic for I can do it. Okay. <laughs> It's not on, so hit that. Thank you. So I know I crossed the threshold. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I have a question about you know how you um, how you will tie um, the findings of this research and like other issues like with this line of justice <laughs> and, and things like that because I, I do think that it's one way to visualize these things and but you know without. Having a like, real and tough conversation on climate justice, I feel like you know, here's another data that proves something we all know that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I I think that's a, a fair point, and I think that part of I don't like talking to you with my back turned to you, but walking backwards is super scary. Okay. Um, I think part of the hope in the way that we're building this and making it available in the way that we are from the early onset is that we are able to involve community partners and folks that have a, a, an important voice representing those that have not been historically included. And I think that's a big piece that I would like to see as a product of the outreach component of this is in order for us to write some of those injustices over time, we have to be made aware of what they are. Now as the climate as the climate person, 
I can provide a variety of maps, right, for a space that say, okay, this is this is the, the environmental context or climatic context for this place. But who is there and the and the construction of what that, that location has come from and who's been a product of that and then who is feeling the impacts of that, that's all stuff or all pieces of this project that I think come from that community involvement. And I'm aware of what the literature says on that topic, but the literature is also biased and missing information. And so as, as I grow and speak to people and learn more about it, I'm able to hopefully identify some of those threats that I might not be thinking of. Now an example of this is, one of the reasons that the Baton Rouge flood was as devastating as it was, was because of the way the infrastructure was built through the interstate system. And people said early on that it was gonna be a problem and if things flooded to the north, it was gonna flood the north because there wasn't enough passageways for the water to get out. And that is exactly what happened and it became a massive issue because we said we, I was not, I was too young when that conversation was happening. Okay, but that idea that there was a, a it was brought up but then not actually supported by that, now let me rephrase that, not put in connection with the scientific community to really push the force in that, that topic, and so it was ignored. And I don't want to see that happen in this project, right? If we have this idea that a particular place might be at a more vulnerable threat, I'm talking about climate risks, but there's a lot of the social side of this that comes into play when we're really looking at those story maps for a given place that we might be able to incorporate as we learn more information. So it's a great and very important question. And I think that's something, hopefully, that we're able to incorporate through that community outreach. It, it is also important for us to make sure that um, the people in that third year that we invite to the Institute, uh, that we are inviting those community partners to participate in and have those discussions. Uh, for those of you who are taking the airport shuttles, if you haven't had me yesterday, I gave a little tour of some, some of the shuttles I was talking about the 2016 flood and how all of this North Louisiana section is the legacy of redlining and segregation and it has some of the worst design infrastructure like that bend on I-10 that floods even in the lightest rain and they constantly have to shut it down. And then just to make matters worse, it's in the, the, um, the shade of Exxon Mobil. Uh, which is never helpful. And any questions from online as well? Thank you. Um, is there a capacity to include traditional knowledges into the risk scale that is being developed? That's a really good question. And so, um, in a way, yes. I think if we are aware of that location, I think that's more difficult because I have a, a, another project that's working with some Native American tribal uh, cultures, a variety of different folks across the Gulf Coast. And there's, um, for, uh, for many obvious historical reasons, there is a sense of sensitivity and protection about that information. And so, when we are allowed to and they want us to, then we will include that whenever possible. Part of it is just being very sensitive to that. Do they want that information to actually be available? Because these are public spaces. Now, sort of on the side line of that, this other project that I have, it is not a public facing project, but it is solely for the betterment and the understanding for that Native American tribe. And I could definitely see how the information we have, well, if they don't want it to be public, we can still provide them with the information that they might be after, right? To try to incorporate what they know and then how we might be able to help them understand something. I think a big piece of it is, as you said, incorporating their knowledge into what we, we have here. And that's so important. And I'm, I'm thankful that I have some connections elsewhere that I might be able to bring that in whenever um, that's a safe space to do so, I think, yeah. Uh, I'm going to bring up, oh, everybody can actually see the fact about yeah. that chart. Uh, but Lee Loomis uh, brought up, how, how do you hope our work will evolve internationally? 
Um, we did, we were accepted as part of a panel for ICA this year. <coughs> and I'm not going. Um, I just, I was, I'm presenting at three conferences in three weeks and I couldn't do that. <laughs> so, but that panel is going forward. Uh, actually, I believe uh, Lee is on the panel. Um, and what I'm hoping is that if, when we are writing our papers and sharing the information, about the methods we use, that they can then be replicated by, let's say, if a European group wanted to do it, if a Southeast Asian group wanted to do it, so that they know exactly, here are the steps we did and where we got our information from, how would that compare to your area? Um, but yeah, internationalization is always a Important but difficult. Hello, thank you. I have two really specific, easy questions. The first is I noticed the map did not have galleries. Oh, lambs. They're actually, look, they're under museums. Okay, so you just lumped them over museums. Okay. Yeah. And the second question, and you, you hinted at this. Um, but what are the other risk factors that are going to go in besides hurricanes and sea level rise? So, Heat, humidity, what else? Yeah, here. Yeah, sorry. So, so, all right, so one of the things that we did early on with the help of some of the grad students, one of them in the room, was to help um, or, or go through the literature that already existed to try to identify the main threats that are already known to these. Now, like I said, it's easy to think about tropical cyclones, but the, the dominant one in the literature was humidity. And so what I'm trying to think about is, you know, there are ways that we can actually quantify humidity. It's, we can think about it as the actual amount of water vapor in the air, grams per cubic meter of air, something like that. We can also think about relative humidity changes and where we can think about um, patterns across space that might have what we would call stagnating air masses or the same type of condition that sits in a place for a long period of time. I think one of the biggest challenges for us is to try to represent power failure in some way. If there's some there is a maximum capacity that every power grid has the ability to actually put out to try to, to you know, provide power for their constituents, right? But that's, that's one value. We also know that when we utilize a lot of that energy at the peak of the season, we can pull in reserves from other places, but what happens if that reserve gets tapped earlier on and then we run out of power and we don't have backup generators. So if that's a, a complicated problem that we're trying to think about how to best represent that. Some of the other things that we were thinking about are stuff like minimum temperatures and freezing occurrences because that can lead to things like power failure. Maximum temperatures and what that might mean, though the max temperature is not as big of a deal as it does only to, to utilize or drain that power grid, especially here in like the deep south. We had considered things like fires, but fires are related to a variety of other things, predominantly a lack of precipitation. So we will look at precipitation where it happens a lot and where it happens very little. Um, and then I think trying to work with those with that advisory board we were speaking of is really a way to try to identify threats that we won't think of as just climate folks. And the biggest one, that I'm still wrapping my head around is humidity. And how do I, I can map it all day, but how do I actually say that this building is gonna be without power and now they're sitting at 85% humidity and their stuff is gonna get ruined. That's a harder thing for me to go from mapping it to knowing when it's too much for a place to actually uh, maintain. So we're gonna try to think about that. But those are the big ones. And if you think of a different one, please tell me. That's, yeah, that's a big piece of this. Yeah. Yeah. Are you really the only one I turned it on for? I don't know why I switched to that. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Katie. I help check the 15,000 PO boxes. <laughs> uh, you know, um, my question is more Louisiana specific for Joe. How will the Mississippi River 
potentially changing course impactful events in the area? Ooh. I know it's a big question. That's a big but one. Okay. I know she's trying to change course. And so, yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks for that question. This one is harder for me to explain, I think, but I'm going to do my best. So, um, historically, we, we do, well, uh, trying to like, remember the audience, you know, and to what level we might be aware of this. If you've taken any geology class ever in your life, maybe it was like a forced gen ed, that's the only reason I took geology. I'm not a geologist, I don't love rocks that much, but when you learn a lot about geology, if you're in the South, you learn about the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River has changed course over tens of thousands of years, shifts to the west, shifts to the east, rivers move as a product of the amount of water that is moving throughout the landscape, as well as a variety of other land use changes that might occur along the way. So that's just to give some context to the question, right? It shifts a lot. And we have been locking that thing in place since New Orleans became a city a long time ago. And because of that, this is why we see faster velocities through the Mississippi River, because we're blocking the sides and it's digging a deeper channel. And so instead of spreading out, the force of that velocity goes downward and through the river channel, eroding the river bank even more so. This is why that water of the Mississippi River, as it reaches the mouth, is moving too fast so it doesn't deposit along the mouth of the Mississippi to build the delta, but instead rockets out to the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, I'm being a little loose there with my words, but builds an island in the Gulf of Mexico. That's effectively what's happening, is we're taking a lot of Mississippi River dirt and moving it into the further reaches of the Gulf so that it doesn't build the mouth of the Mississippi. Okay, context. Now, this idea of how it's gonna shift, the reality is, I don't know that any of us really know what will happen if, how do I say it? If we were, okay, I'm gonna back this up. This is a hard question to answer. We have locked it up for so long that if we were to actually say, all right, let's let the Mississippi move. We're gonna just take the levee structures off and let the Mississippi do what it's gonna do. We have no way of knowing what it's actually gonna do as a product of that. We have models that we can build out to try to understand those dynamics but we have never seen the Mississippi flow freely since we've populated the South in the city structure that we have today. It flowed beautifully before we start like locking up levee structures and stuff that actually force like the creation of the settlement of New Orleans as the city that it is today, okay? So I say all of this because there is talk of things like this, this idea of trying to let water out of some space and you know, how will it affect Glam's? Everything on the map is gone. Everything that you saw surrounding New Orleans in that area would be flooded. Most of, New, all of New Orleans is in a bowl. Now, it is a cool place to visit. I know you're here for a few days. I don't know if you can get down there or not. It is a very cool place to visit. And it has nothing to do with Bourbon Street. Okay, that is fun too when you're 22 and don't care about your liver. But otherwise, <laughs> it's a little bit dramatic. But it's great food, great music, great culture, great history, so much really incredible stuff in the city of New Orleans. But if you're walking through the French Quarter by St. Peter's Square, you will see barges above your head. And you're gonna, for if, depending on how many of those other things, you know, cocktails you might have had, you might not notice, but barges should not be above your head, right? If you are in a city on the ground and there is a river right to your side with a boat above you, it suggests that there is a wall protecting you from that boat and the water it's riding on. And if that wall is gone, what is going to happen to New Orleans? It is going to flood. That is, we have protected it to allow it to exist. So that is a loaded question because if we were to actually allow it to move in the way that it's trying to and has been for a long while, it's going to flood everything around it because it's going to move. We would have to actually move the city of New Orleans, which we have seen time and time again. We are resistant to that. And there are reasons why I'm not here to argue against that. All I know is that there is resistance to that. And so if we try to tell a place that it's going to get flooded time and time and time again, but they don't want to leave, what, you know, what happens? So it's kind of a, it's a social question. It is also an environmental one. 
and it's a, a hard question to actually uh, to get at. But I think flooding is that's it would flood everything to the west of the Mississippi River. The, my my gut is that that's the direction it's attempting to shift in, if memory serves. Though I haven't looked at that literature in a long time. But if if we allow it to, it would take over that entire region. All those little dots that are protected now, even with the three feet of sea level rise, as a product of all the current walls that exist, would be underwater. I, I would also point out that LSU does have a giant Mississippi River model. Oh yeah, that they're running simulations to try to figure all this out. Um, Edward, yes, yeah. and I'm actually going to read something on yeah, the. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so first off, um, uh, Lee suggested looking at the DPCAP, kelp.org for humidity. Ooh, thank you. Uh, and Amber, thinking about smoke particulate in the air as a result of wild wildflowers. Oh, yeah. That is not correct. Oh, wow. Wild fires recently and how it sort of seems like they're increasing, would this tool be able to identify if that sort of environmental pollution could be, at, could be a risk to a collection or a historical place? My simple response is yeah. Yeah. I, like it's, it, it's important, but I don't think it's within our... Yeah, I mean, I ability. think... Uh, am I on there? Yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's part of where... We do have to draw a line for where our project would have to effectively stop as far as the types of variables that we will be able to include, because it'll just keep going if we went with everything, right? I think the particulate matter is important and that environmental pollution is, is certainly important. My question to that question, Amber, would be um, in what way would that particulate matter impact your facility? Because that's how I would want to think about it so I can try to represent that environmental risk properly. So if you're talking about it actually gets into the airway infrastructure and then that impacts the archive material in some way, okay, maybe there's a way that I can monitor particulate matter in a place to say that the risk grows of this threat when we have higher amounts. So we could do that, we could look at those data, but I would need to know more clarity into how that would actually impact the glam, perhaps, as far as what happens once the dust or debris or particular matter is. And, and, and I think if we can, like you were saying earlier, look at the underlying cause for the wildfires, the more drought conditions, dry conditions, uh, what sparks the wild, the higher amounts of wildfire. Um, but then you have to then say, okay, well, if there's a bigger risk for wildfire in Nova Scotia, then apparently New York and Boston are at a much greater risk at that time for uh, for an orange sky. Yeah, for air quality. Um, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I think this ties a couple of um, comments and questions uh, around like, what risk are you looking at while also thinking about like if you haven't already had a previous proposal, but uh, managing scope, right? So are you looking at environmental risks inclusive of people as being an environmental risk um, and social impacts of our decisions and in particular the way we've like exploited and abused our natural environment? Um, if so, then yeah, like we're thinking way more than like pollution. We're thinking of like, you know, rising heats in overpopulated areas as well as like historic poverty levels and why certain institutions are under-resourced and some are more well-resourced. Um, so I'm, I'm in particularly interested in knowing if there is a line that's being drawn um, and more specifically what the intentionality of that is. Um, so say from my field of study, we don't draw a line between humans and the, the natural environment, that it, we are all part of the same environment, um, but that can become unmanageable when you start trying to think of the variables. Um, so if you could speak more to those conversations, if you already had them, or at least start thinking about them, because it, it is something that at least a couple of us in the field um, are trying very hard to at least be intentional, even if there are limitations. Sure. Um, so like you said, you, you, having to draw 
limits, particularly with three years. <laughs> and one of those years is planning an institute. Um, my whole thought behind this was, let's get one thing moving forward, and then ask for more money. <laughs> Honestly. Um, and because I, yeah, like you said, that could be a 10-year project right there. Uh, but once we have the infrastructure, OK, that's a loaded word. But once we have the data infrastructure, and we can start adding things um, like population density, um, pop, um, sorry, my brain is starting to go for me. Um, land property value, um, income level. Yes, socioeconomics, all sorts of Yeah, historical, which is stuff we can pull from the census, even though there are issues with that, uh, as far as undercounting and overcounting. Uh, but we can start layering these things on to perhaps see, okay, this area that seems to be a really great risk, what are some other factors here? Is it, this is also where there's a lot of community-based uh, museums. Oh, okay, and now I've got to take a quick tangent. Um, is Kirsten, oh, there you are, yeah. Uh, so there is an African-American museum in Baton Rouge that today is reopening. Uh, the founder, unfortunately, uh, passed away um, three years ago, four years ago. And so it's been stagnant, but it is reopening today. And part of the Juneteenth celebration is hand-walking all the material from the old to the new. Uh, and it's going to be open. And I was thinking of the River Road uh, Museum as well, and, but also the cemeteries that happen to be on the various, like ExxonMobil, um, Dow Chemicals, they, not surprisingly, happen to have um, former plantation cemeteries on them that they were just now allowing people to come on. Um, this is a long-winded way of saying it. it's a difficult issue, but yes, I think starting with one thing and then yes, sorry. So, <laughs> think, um, to just add a little to that, I think that's a great question, and I think we should, as a group, have a clear, intentional conversations about that. So I appreciate that that advice and that thought process. One way that I was thinking about it is, and it all started actually because of the tour of the State Archive, that facility is amazing. I, I have not explored, you know, I've not explored all the archives in the world to know all things, right, about how amazing it really is, but it all was, from what I learned, kind of built as a response to an event that happened in the 80s where it all flooded, the old archives building flooded really badly, and then they had to rebuild it, but they built it with intention. And that's curious to me because in a lot of these places where I might be providing some environmental risk of what's happening, what then when I think about is it actually a threat to this place? That's a different question, right? And then the threat then I need to bring in the social piece. I have to. Without it, I can't really understand the threat. So so in that context, I've been thinking about all right, well, if I hold in my mind the Louisiana State Archives as like the the, the cream of the crop, because they have this fourth floor backup generator power. They have all of these, these intentional, constructive purposes to protect their materials. What about when I'm in a place that does not have any of that? And what does that mean for that threat? Because they might have the same level of risk, the same statistical or historical frequency of, of physical occurrence. But they're shoved in a basement. But they're shoved in a basement, and so if they flood, it's a much bigger problem than if that building floods. So that's one way that I think I can bring in this context of preparedness and its actual kind of relationship to adaptation, adaptive capacity or resilience, et cetera. Some key words that we think that I think of when I think about a population and its ability to come back from a disaster. So I think that's a way that I can bring it in in this first stage without getting very much caught in between these lines that might exist between what's physical, what's environmental. 
as a geographer, you can't have one without the other. I, meant, I said it environmental, I meant uh, social, my, my apologies. You can't have one without the other. They are, they're constantly connected. They're, they're, that's the only way they operate. But, but when trying to think about how to categorize that, it is complicated. And I want it to be something that people on the other side can digest and actually maybe situate themselves in with more information. They might themselves know that they're you know, managing this population or they're in charge of protecting this population from a disaster and they're aware of those their own um, restrictions or their own limitations that they might exist with resources, et cetera, and we then can utilize that or use that as kind of leverage to better understand the threat for that, that person. So, Yes, but not in the right way, but in a way that maybe will get me closer to the right way. That's the whole And for our last question, before we get to go to lunch. Um, yeah, I'll try and keep it really quick. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about risk, right? So you guys have been using the term risk a lot today. Um, and full disclosure, that risk is my thing. So if this is too far afield, please say so. so one of the things we know is that people behave really differently in response to the same risk information based on like, a lot of social factors and individual factors. And I'm wondering what you hope people will do with what you're creating, and if you've thought through what you would do if they interpret and behave differently than you intend, right? So an example would be looking at that list of endangered institutions and instead of saying, oh, we need to devote resources and help them, saying, oh, we should start supporting the places that are likely to survive, right? Creating new and different types of risks for already threatened institutions. Um, and I'm wondering, this is maybe a big question, but sort of at the end of this project, are, have you thought about what you hope for the endangered institutions? What will come out of this for them? That is an excellent question. Um, yes. I have a comment to that. I plan on using. Oh, do you want to? I'm like, I don't know what to do. Thank you. This is a young So, I don't think the state archives is going to be an endangered institution, hopefully, anytime soon. But when I'm looking at your data, I was thinking to myself, I can't wait till this is done because I'm going to use this data to go to the legislature to ask for more money for whatever risk it is that you just determined that the Baton Rouge area has. And so, to I don't want to answer for you, but that's how I plan on using the data, and maybe other institutions could could do the same. And I'm glad that we put that um, comment up there about the humidity because she shared that. Um, information with us last year and we actually used it and so it's a website where you can go and put in your temperature and how long you've been without power and it'll basically tell you how many days that you have until your humidity vulnerability is uh, like not good enough you know and so uh, last year she came and spoke and our facility manager used that data to tell Entergy if you don't get the state archives back online by noon on whatever then it's going to be a real problem for the whole state, and it worked. So we leveraged the information to get energy to take action, and so this data can actually help. And so thank you for doing it. Um, but also just because we are pressed for time, yeah. it actually is something that it's a really interesting problem, um, and I'd love to chat about it some this week to see what we could do. Um, my final thoughts before we release you for food um, is I just want to make sure I have another group of students who are also working on building um, a, it is the foundation of a data set trying to gather documentation on disaster related damage. So it's really difficult to go too far back. They're trying to just do five years. Um, and I have enough students that they're doing it regionally. And once we have that benchmark, then it's a lot easier to start adding to it every year and gathering those sources, the, that documentation, because that's the other problem. Every time we talk to the media 
like, oh, do you have somebody you can talk to who's lost something? Well, not off the top of my head. I, like, I don't necessarily know some a community-based archive that lost all their entire collection because of item. I have a feeling that I do, but I don't know it for sure. Uh, so that's also something important. But thank you all for the first plenary. Hopefully all of them are this good. Um, as far as audience participation, not as far as this was a great presentation. <laughs>